Okay, everyone. So today our plan is to just go over kind of a quick review session on everything that will be on the final exam or what I think will be on the final exam. Um, what I go over isn't entirely comprehensive, uh, meaning there are some things that I have left out that could potentially show up on your exam. Um, the point of this was really to go over each chapter we've covered this semester and kind of pick out the key points. Remember, your exam's probably around, I think, around 50 questions, um, 40 to 50 questions. Um, we covered about eight chapters. Um, and so there's only five, six, maybe seven questions per chapter. And so the little nitty gritty nitpicky things won't show up um, as often as the big key topics. So that's what I will focus on. Um, but before getting into the PowerPoint, um, where I kind of go over the main things of each chapter, um, this video, which I'll post an announcement about, is going to be in this final review folder um, under my material. Um, you'll also notice, again, this will be uploaded, this video, into this uh, folder as well. But the, there's a link to an SI evaluation sheet. Um, if you guys wouldn't mind filling that out, it should only take three or four minutes. Um, it's really just so that uh, my bosses can collect information and hopefully be able to um, expand the SI program into other classes that are difficult um, just so that you and all students coming to UConn just have um, more access to this resource. So again, it should only take two, three minutes. If you could please fill it out, that would be um, amazing. Okay, so jumping into our final review. So chapter 11, um, if you haven't started looking over it, has to do um, with colligative properties and solutions, right? So I'm just kind of kind of calling it solutions in general. So some basic terminology you might not remember from way back at the very beginning of the semester is miscible versus immiscible fluids or liquids, right? So miscible, we think of able to mix, right? They both start with M, miscible, mix. Um, and so these are two fluids that would completely mix together and you really wouldn't be able to tell them apart. Immiscible, it's probably a lot easier to see, are liquids that do not mix, right? So the classic example is oil and water, right? If you leave them together in a container, they will completely separate, and that's because they are immiscible. So you can kind of think to like a salad dressing, um, you'll typically see the water layer or aqueous layer on the bottom, and the oil layer tends to be on top, okay? And then we deal with electrolytes, which we'll kind of get into more when we uh, review the Van Hoff factor. But right, electrolytes are things that break into its component ions, right? So NaCl, um, sodium chloride, will break into Na plus and Cl minus, its respective ions. And when we see the term strong and weak electrolytes, you can kind of think of them fairly analogous to acids and bases, right? Our strong electrolytes will break up completely. And our weak electrolytes will only break up a little bit. Now, again, I'll talk about it when we get to the Van Hoff factor, which we denote with I. Um, but if they ever give you a compound, you expect that it's going to break up completely, meaning NaCl would break up into Na plus and Cl minus completely. And so your Van Hoff factor would be two, because two ions are a result of um, NaCl being dropped in solution. Um, we don't really think of weak electrolytes, or we don't make the assumption unless that's what we're solving for. Um, but again, I'll get to that in a couple of slides. Okay, so solution terminology, I'm sure, I'm sure you guys are all very familiar with these terms by now. So solute is what we typically add to a solvent, um, right? So the solvent we typically see as a liquid, and solute you can honestly most of the time see as like a um, solid, right? We might add sugar to water or salt to water. So that sugar or salt that we add in, are adding would be our solute. And our solvent, again, it's our typically our liquid and it's what does the dissolving. It's pretty much the com main component of the solution. And then our solution is just made of those two components combined, right? So once you have a solute that's added to a solvent, we have a solution. Now we have three different types of solution. They typically only focus on two um, in this course. They don't talk about supersaturated too often, um, but just so you know it, I'll throw it in there. So a saturated solution is a solution in which as much solute as possible is added to the solvent where it's all dissolved. 
right? So the maximum amount of solute is dissolved in a saturated solution, okay? Unsaturated solution means you haven't added enough solute to become saturated, right? You can still dissolve more solute in your solvent, okay? And then supersaturated solutions is like when you add too much solute to your solvent. So um, a classic example of this is if you ever make like salt water in a cup, maybe have like a canker sore or something, when you add the salt to hot water, you'll notice the salt dissolves. But if you add too much, you're actually going to see grains of salt particles at the bottom of your cup of water. And that's because it's super saturated, right? It's no longer saturated because you added too much of your solute to your solvent, and you'll actually see a buildup of the solid at the bottom of your container, okay? And just um, something to talk about solutions and solubility. Um, do remember the term like dissolves like based on polarity, right? So water is a polar solvent, and so water will dissolve um, polar molecules, right, uh, for the most part. And nonpolar um, solvents, so something like uh, benzene, for example, is nonpolar, would dissolve nonpolar solutes. So like dissolves like, um, again, that's at the very beginning of this. I'm not, you kind of talked about it last semester as well. So I'm not sure if that'll be a huge um, factor on the exam. But definitely just keep that in mind. If they ask you what will be soluble in water, out of the choices A through D, you'll be looking for what is a polar molecule. Okay. And then we also learned about Henry's law, which when I saw this equation definitely seems like a very long time ago. But what this says is that the concentration um, of a dissolved gas in a solvent, right, so how much gas is dissolved in a solvent, is equal to K, which is just some constant, multiplied by the partial pressure of the gas, okay? And the kind of a classic example to think about this is soda, right? So in soda, we have um, CO2, or carbon dioxide, that is dissolved in our actual soda liquid, right? So our, we have a certain concentration of CO2 dissolved. And that kind of comes, um, it's associated with a certain partial pressure of CO2 in the can above the liquid, right? So there's going to be a little bit of CO2 above it that has a partial pressure, um, and that causes a certain amount to be dissolved in our soda. But when we open a can of soda, right, we're expanding the volume, right, that CO2 gas that was trapped at the top of the can is now exposed to the environment, meaning that the volume is much, much greater than before, okay? And so if the volume is much greater, the pressure is going to go way down. And so because when we look at this equation, if pressure goes down and K is a constant, that means our concentration of dissolved gas is also going to decrease, which is why when you open soda, you see all those CO2 bubbles fly open to the top, and it's because the concentration of dissolved gas also decreases um, because you're, you de decreased your pressure by opening the can of soda. Okay? And then we also went over measurements of concentration, right? So by now we're very familiar with molarity. That's moles of solute divided by liters of solution. Now it's been a long time since we used this. Um, molality, right? It is very similar um, in words, but it's molality. We denote this with a little m, right? And that is moles of solute, so the numerator is still the same, but the denominator is actually kilograms, and it's actually kilograms of solvent, okay? So definitely realize it's not kilograms of uh, solution, it's kilograms of solvent, okay? That's in the denominator. We have mole fraction, which we denote by x, and that means moles of whatever component we're talking about, so maybe moles of our solute divided by our total moles. That would be our mole fraction. And mass percent is the mass of some component divided by total mass. Now, a lot of times we actually need to interconvert between these. You guys might remember that. Again, this was a very long time ago. But whenever we interconvert um, between these, we are going to um, make certain assumptions to make these calculations easier, right? And so um, our calculations uh, for molarity, if we're trying to go from molarity to anything else, it's easiest if we assume we have one liter of solution, 
right? That you can use other assumptions, but that will make your calculations the easiest. Okay, so if you start with molarity and you have to convert to any one of these, start with one liter of solution. If you start with molality, assume you have one kilogram of solvent, okay? Mole fraction, it's easiest if you assume you have one total mole, right? So again, assuming one mole is your denominator. And mass percent, we typically say it's easiest to assume you have 100 grams. And the reason for this is because mass percent is a percentage, you can just drop the percent sign and write grams instead, okay? And again, that is to interconvert between these. You can use other assumptions, um, so other starting amounts, but that always makes it easiest, the ones that I just listed there. Okay, and colligative properties. So these properties change depending not on what is dissolved in your solvent, right? So it doesn't matter what the solute is that's in your solvent, it's just how much, right? It's the concentration of your solute that changes um, these different colligative properties. So we have four main ones. We have vapor pressure lowering, boiling point elevation, freezing point depression, and osmotic pressure, okay? Now vapor pressure lowering can be described by Routes law which is the pressure of um, a gas, you know, a pressure, like your vapor pressure. So the vapor pressure of a gas, which we're just going to denote as P1, is equal to the mole fraction of your solvent multiplied by the pure vapor pressure of that solvent, right? So maybe a certain uh, solvent has a vapor pressure of 2, right? And as we add salt to this, right, as we add salt to that solvent, that salt molecules are actually going to block your solvent molecules that are trying to become vapor pressure, right, so gas above the solution. And so as we add more solute to it, our vapor pressure is going to decrease, okay? So again, if our solvent typically, normally a pure um, solution of a solvent has a vapor pressure of 2, we would plug that in for P1 naught, okay, that just means our pure vapor pressure, multiplied by our mole fraction of our solvent, again, that's really important to note because most people think it's mole fraction of solute, because um, often when we do calculations in terms of solute, but here it's actually mole fractions of solvent equals our new vapor pressure, okay, and our new vapor pressure, P1, should always be lower than P1 naught, right? And that's because our mole fraction, which is X of our solvent, can never be above one. And the more solute we add, the lower that value of X solvent will be, okay? Now freezing point, I'm uh, sorry, boiling point elevation and freezing point depression, you'll notice are basically the same thing. One's just in terms of freezing, which we denote with F, the other one in terms of boiling B. Um, so you'll notice KB and KF, those are actually constants um, depending on what your solvent is. So that will be given to you or you'll be solving for it. Something to note is here we use little m in our equations, which stands for molality. Okay, so for this calculation or for these two calculations, you will be using molality, not molarity. Okay, that's very important to note. And again, here we see I, which stands for the Van Hoff factor. Okay, so again, Van Hoff factor is really saying how many components will my compound um, dissociate into when it's added to solvent, right? So NaCl, when you add it to water, will break up into Na plus and Cl minus, right? So once it's in water, it'll break into two ions, right? One is Na plus, the other one's Cl minus two ions, our Van Hoff factor would be two. Things like glucose, C6H12O6, isn't, uh, it's a covalent, it's covalently bound, right? It's not an ionic compound, and so it won't dissociate or split up when it's added to water. So the Van Hoff factor for compounds that are linked via covalent bonds would be one, okay? And so really you're looking for how many separate ions will it split into, and that is your Van Hoff factor. Now you'll always assume, for example, NaCl will split into two ions, 
right? You'll always assume they completely dissociate like that unless they have you solving for the Van Hoff factor. Just note that if you're solving for I or the Van Hoff factor, it actually can be a decimal, okay? But that's only, again, if you're solving for it. If you have to use it to solve for the change in freezing point, you will always assume that it completely dissociates into its respective ions, okay? And then um, you'll notice I actually have two equations under freezing point depression. This second equation also applies to the boiling point elevation. Um, I just remember a lot of students after the multiple choice exam um, involving chapter 11, or maybe it was open-ended, asked me how you would go about it when multiple solutes are added, right? And so this is kind of what the equation would look like if you had multiple solutes. So I believe the problem may have added NaCl to the solution with a certain molarity and glucose to the solution. And so glucose and NaCl would each have its own molality, right? So maybe M1 would be the molality of NaCl, M2 might represent the molality of glucose. And then again, we talked about how NaCl should split into two ions while glucose won't split into anything, right? It'll just stay as glucose. And so I1 would be the Van Hoff factor for NaCl, which would be 2. And I2 would be the Van Hoff factor for glucose, which would be 1. Okay, and so you'd kind of plug it in in this format if you did have multiple um, solutes. Not sure if that'll come up, but I know it came up on the in the past, and many students asked me um, questions about it. So that's kind of me addressing that. And lastly, we have osmotic pressure. Right, so this is the pressure, which we measure in ATM. The pressure it takes to resist osmosis, which is the natural flow of water from areas of low concentration of solute to high concentration of solute. Okay, and so we denote osmotic pressure with pi, right, the Greek letter pi, and that is equal to big M. Okay, so in this calculation, we actually use molarity, not molality, so definitely note that. R, which is our ideal gas law constant, 0 0.08206, and how I know it's that value of R is osmotic pressure is, again, a pressure that will be measured in atmospheres, atmospheres or ATM, and so I know my R value needs to have atmospheres in it, and that's how I know it's the ideal gas law, R. T, our temperature in Kelvin, again, remember it's in Kelvin, and our Van Hoff factor, right, so there's going to be some solute and um, we are going to calculate how many um, ions it makes when it's added to solution. When we multiply all these up, we would get our osmotic pressure. Okay, so that's pretty much the gist of chapter 11. Now we're going to look over chapter 12, which in general looks at rates. Okay, so we're going to start by looking at just very simplistic rates and then relative rates, because I think it is important to be able to differentiate between these. So whenever you're asked to solve for a rate of something, maybe the rate of appearance of species B, right? So how quickly is B appearing, right? If they give you information about time and information about a change in concentration in um, substance B, right? You're just going to plug it in and do the change in concentration over the change in time. That is your rate for B. So if they ever ask you about a certain species and they give you both the change in concentration of that species and the change in time, you very simplistically plug it in to that um, equation at the top, the change in concentration divided by the change in time. Now you might remember equations dealing with relative rates, right? And here we do one over a coefficient multiplied by a rate equals another rate. Now you only use this when they give you information about, let's say, A in this equation, right? So if they tell you the change in concentration of A, but in the question they're actually asking about the change or um, the rate of B, right? They're asking about the rate of B, but they give you information about the rate of A. That's when you use relative rates, right? And so we'd say that the rate of B is equal to, or I should really say 1 over b, right, 1 over the coefficient of b, which is 1 here, times the rate of b is equal to negative 1 over the coefficient of a, 
times the con change of concentration of A over change in time. Now that last portion in parentheses, change in concentration of A over change in time, I would just write that as rate of A, right? That is the rate of disappearance of A. And how I know it's disappearance, it's because A is a reactant, and so it's going to be disappearing, while B, a product, is going to be appearing over time. Okay, and that's also why I have a negative in front um, of the kind of right side of the equation, just because A is disappearing. Now what this is saying, that little a, one over the little a, represents the coefficient in front of A. So what this is really saying is that our rate of B is equal to the negative, well negative, one over two, or negative one half, times the rate of A. Now that actually makes sense because the rate of B, right, the appearance of B should be half the rate of A. And that's because for every two moles of A being used, we're going to see one mole of B. Okay, and so the rate should really be half as quick as A. Okay, so these relative rates where we use coefficients in front, like one over coefficients, we only use when they tell us information about a different component then the answer applies to, right? So they give you information about A, but you're being asked about B, that's when you use relative rates. Okay, so rate laws. So rate laws, we write for the entire reaction, right? And so we'll see that the rate of a reaction is dependent on the concentra uh, concentration of reactants. Okay, so it is not dependent on the concentration of products. Okay, and the general term I have, um, like general rate law, is rate equals k times a raised to the m times b raised to the n, where a and b are both reactants. Now note that k will actually vary in number and in units from problem to problem, right? So our rate will always have the units of molar, right, big M, divided by time. Okay, so our units of K need to cancel out with the units of our reactants so that our rates units is molar per time. And they would specify time might be seconds, minutes, hours, years, days. It doesn't really matter. They can use any unit of time. Okay, unlike when we get into equilibrium, which we'll get into shortly, um, so in equilibrium, our superscripts are determined um, by coefficients, but remember rates are superscripts, so M and N will, can only be determined experimentally. And this is kind of like the very classic chart problems that they give you, right? So just note that our superscripts, M and N, can only be determined experimentally. And if they ask you for the overall um, reaction order, it would be M plus N, right? You add your superscripts to find reaction order, okay? And so when you're looking at a chart and they're asking for the reaction order and the value of K, remember to use trials where only one variable, or what I mean by that is one reactant changes in concentration, right? So if we have reactant A and reactant B, I wanna know the order of, like the reaction order of uh, reactant A by making sure that the concentration of B does not change between those trials, right? Because if we have two variables changing, we don't really know each one's effect on rate. So we need to isolate them separately. Okay, so once you pick two um, trials in which only one variable changes, then you use kind of this general format that I have at the bottom, right? Rate of one over rate of two equals the concentration of A during trial one over the um, concentration of A during trial two raised to the M, right? Now, which, um, you know, which trial you put in the numerator and denominator does not matter as long as the rate that you put in the numerator is associated with the concentration you put in the numerator for A, right? So if in trial one, our rate is two, and in trial two, our rate is four, and during trial one, our concentration of A is 0.1, and in um, trial two, it's 0.2. As long as my all my trial one information is in the numerator or the denominator, and my trial two information is in the other one, either numerator or denominator, 
this system should work every time. What you do here is you basically just solve for M, which is your reaction order in terms of that reactant. Okay. Once you find the reaction order, so M and N for all the reactants involved in the reaction, what you do to find the value of K is you can plug in the rate and the concentrations from any trial. Okay, No matter what the trial, the answer should come out the same. And you just plug in those values and solve for K. Um, and just remember to use the right units of K. They love to give you the wrong units of K as a potential multiple choice answer. So don't just look for the correct number. Also look for the correct units. Um, a new type of problem they've kind of brought up in the past, um, like in this semester, is where one where you actually have to make a new trial. Um, and so basically the goal of a new trial is you basically need to do it when there's no experiments. Let's just say you can solve the reaction order of A but not B. Um, you want to make a new trial that allows you to test for B. Um, I'm actually, and I'm going to talk about this more at the end, I am going to release um, no multiple choice questions, but I do have some long answer questions. Um, I think it's about 10 to 12 long answer questions that I'm going to need to release probably tomorrow, um, just because I'm not sure if I'm going to have time to finish it today. Um, but I will put in a problem where you do have to add a new trial. Um, so if learning how to make a new trial confuses you, um, definitely look over that problem and um, I'll also post the solutions tomorrow as well. Uh, but definitely look at that. Um, I think the work for that explains it um, much better than my words can. It's kind of hard to explain. Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay, so now reaction orders. So we really only focus on three types of reactions. We look at zero order reactions, um, which means that our rate is independent of the concentration of all of our reactants. And here, our rate will actually be equal to our K constant, right? Which K is our rate constant, okay? A first order reaction, the general um, style for this is rate equals K times the concentration of A, okay? And here, the rate is directly proportional to the concentration of one reactant. Okay, so they're directly proportional and it's to one reactant. A second order reaction, there's two different forms it can actually have. It can be rate equals K times A squared, right? So the reaction order is two because the superscript of A is two. Or it could be rate equals K times A raised to the first times the concentration of B also raised to the first. And because both superscripts are one here, the overall reaction order would be one plus one, which is two. Okay, so these are the three we focus on mainly. Okay, and so here's kind of a chart looking at all of them and looking at all the important information you know. Um, you guys have taken the exams on this. You guys know how important and helpful this chart can be. Okay, so at the top, they look at just the rate law. We kind of went over that. Um, the second row looks at the um, units of our rate constant, so the units of K. Um, if you need to memorize those, okay, um, but if you really should get in the habit and hopefully you're still familiar with being able to derive the units because they could ask you for units of K um, of a reaction order that is higher than 2. Um, but we really only focus on these three types of reactions because this is these types of reactions is what they give you the integrated rate laws for, which is our third row. Right, so the integrated rate law for a zero order reaction is the concentration of A equals negative KT plus the initial concentration of A. Right, the integrated rate law for the first order reaction is very similar but involves the natural logs. And for a second order reaction, it's one over concentration. So it's one over the concentration of A at a certain time period equals KT plus one over the initial concentration of A, right? That zero, that not means initial concentration. And so basically what this allows you to do is solve for either how much concentration you have left 
after a certain period of time, right? So if they ask you, okay, after 10 hours, how much of A do you have left? You're going to be using the integrated rate law. The other potential question that they often ask is, okay, you started with this amount. Now you have this new amount, right? You had 10 molar before. You have 0.5 molar now. How long did it take for you to get to this new concentration? So in essence, often they have you solve for the concentration after a certain amount of time, or they have you solve for time itself given the concentration. Okay, so typically, if we're looking at a zero order reaction, they would have you be solving for just the concentration of A or time. That's typically what they have you solve for. Now, um, a very common question that they ask has to do with first order reactions, right? So remember, and we'll get here in a minute, but you can actually solve for the half life um, of a first order reaction without needing the initial concentration. And so what this means is they often will give you a problem and say, 10 years is your half-life for a first order reaction. Basically, um, how long will it take for you to have one two hundredth the concentration that you initially had? Okay, so for first order reactions, they often honestly give it to you in terms of a fraction um, instead of actually giving you solid amounts of concentration. Um, and so just remember your log rules here. This equation would actually simplify, right? If we're looking at the integrated rate law for first order reactions, it would actually simplify to the natural log of A divided by, right? It's natural log of this whole thing. Natural log of A divided by initial concentration of A equals negative KT. And so if they asked you to solve for the time in which you had one two hundredth of the concent initial concentration, you would do the natural log of 1 over 200 equals negative kT, okay? Um, just something to kind of keep in mind. You'll definitely, um, definitely should note, and I'm sure you're familiar with, um, a lot of times they don't actually tell you what type of reaction you have. They actually tell you about the linear fit model for a reaction, right? So they'll say time was graphed against the natural log of A, and this gave you a straight slope, right? Like a straight line. Whenever you graph something and get a straight line, if you graph just the concentration of A versus time, it's a, always going to be a zero order reaction. If you get a straight line from um, making a graph out of the natural log of A versus time, it is always going to be a first order reaction, and if you ever make a plot and get a straight line from graphing one over a concentration versus time, it's always going to be a second order. So they love to tell you which type of order reaction you have by giving you uh, information about a graph. Okay, and then kind of the last thing to touch on is half-life, right? So half-life is how long it takes for half of something to disappear, right? So if I started with four molar of A, um, and its half-life is 10 years, we'll say after 10 years, it would now be two molar solution of A, right? Half of it disappeared um, over that half-life. And these equations just um, help you solve for that. So again, A naught is the initial concentration of um, reactant A. T one half just means half-life. Um, K is our rate constant. Um, and yeah, those are pretty much any of the variables um, that you would need to solve a problem for that. Okay, Whew, a lot of talking. Just kind of wrapping up chapter um, 12. So we end talking about collision theory, right? Um, and so collision theory is really the idea that a reaction occur doesn't always occur, right? There's kind of three different um, portions to will a reaction occur. The first one is, do the molecules trying to undergo the reaction have the correct orientation, right? So component one of collision theory is orientation. The second component is collision frequency, right? So when things collide more often, they typically have a higher chance of undergoing the reaction. So typically, a high collision frequency um, helps a reaction occur. Okay, so orientation, collision frequency, and the last one is, does the collision um, or how many of the collisions have enough energy to undergo the reaction? 
right? So this is kind of talking about activation energy. Okay, so the three portions to a collision and will a reaction occur is orientation, collision frequency, and enough energy to undergo the reaction. And we can actually mathematically express this um, with the reaction K equals A, which is our Arrhenius constant, multiplied by E raised to the negative activation energy over RT. Now again, activation energy is the energy barrier that um, reactants must overcome to become products, right? So that's our activation energy. Now if you look at the equation to the right, it's just the same equation I just talked about, but it's taking the natural log of the entire thing. So now we have it in terms of the natural log of K equals the natural log of A, or our Arrhenius constant, minus activation energy over RT, okay? Now this is actually in Y equals MX plus B format, okay? So if they ever say that the natural log of K is being graphed against one over um, our temperature, right, with one over temperature being on the x-axis, our y-intercept is actually equal to the ln of A, and our slope would be equal to negative activation energy over R. Okay, so a very common question is they would basically tell you that you're plotting this, and they would say the slope is some value. And all they would ask, what is the activation energy? And all you have to know is that the slope, a value they gave you, is equal to negative activation energy over R, and you just easily multiply it by their slope by negative r, and that would give you your activation energy, which would be your answer. Okay? Um, one thing to note about this r value, right? So activation energy is an energy, which we measure in uh, joules, right? Or kilojoules, so energy, which means our r value needs to be in terms of joules. And so we're actually, for this equation, going to use the 8.31 r value because that one is in terms of joules. Okay, and the last equation, which is kind of in the bottom left corner, is the natural log of K2 over K1 equals our activation energy over R multiplied by 1 over T1 minus 1 over T2. So uh, just a couple things to note. So this equation you use when you have two different temperatures, because different temperatures yield different rate constants, so different Ks, right? And so it's know that the top K value, or K2, is associated with the second temperature, right, T2. Um, definitely know that. Um, temperature should be in Kelvin in all of these equations. That's another thing to note. Um, and you might be familiar, and um, I'm not sure if this will be part of the practice that I send out. Um, but if not, I know I've posted problems like this in the past, and all the access to those are still available. Um, but this is a kind of similar. This is the equation you use for one of those catalyzed versus uncatalyzed reaction problems. Um, so definitely take a look at one of those. I know Dr. Katie has some in his lectures. Um, I know it was definitely on my, one of my practice exams. So definitely go back and see that. Um, and yeah, so definitely look over those because that is something that they've emphasized a fair amount this year. Okay, chapter 13, Equilibrium. So I'm sure this seems a lot more familiar than the last two chapters because we kind of been work, worked on equilibrium for, uh, I think, three or four chapters. So the equilibrium constant is we denote with K, and we only use that at equilibrium. And for the reaction, I guess I should have written it. For the very simple reaction, A plus, like A time, A is a coefficient, A plus B, B goes to C, C plus D, D, right? Just a very simple equation. Um, I'm sorry, that's actually reverse. This would be for the equation um, little c, big C, plus little d as a coefficient, big D, goes to small a, big A, plus small b, big B, okay? So re uh, reactants are on the bottom, products are on the top, okay? And they are raised to their um, coefficients, right? So we don't have to experimentally determine it here, but um, like we did in rates, um, our coefficients are the superscripts in this case. But again, it's products on top, reactants on the bottom. Our reaction quotient, you'll notice I wrote in the same exact format, and it's because to calculate them, it's actually identical. 
but we denote this with Q and we use this at any given point in time, right? So if we don't know that we're at equilibrium, it's proper to say we're solving for our reaction quotient, okay? Now remember when we solve for these, we only use this for ions and gases, right? We do not include any solids or liquids in our um, equilibrium expressions, okay? And so a very classic chapter 13 problem is you'll be given the equilibrium constant, right? And you'll be given either uh, ion concentrations or partial pressure of gases, and you'll be able to solve for Q, and then they'll ask you to compare Q with K and talk about the reaction. So again, Q and K both represent products over reactants. So if Q is less than K, right, that means Q has too few products, right? It's not at equilibrium because it doesn't have enough products, which means the forward reaction will be favored, okay? If Q is equal to K, we're at equilibrium. And if Q is greater than K, right, that means at the point that we're solving Q for, we have too much in the numerator, right? It's too big. We have too many products. And so the reverse reaction will be favored, right? And reverse reaction meaning from right to left when looking at a chemical equation. Okay. Just other common chapter 13 things. Um, they don't bring up this equation too much. So if you solve for the equilibrium constant in terms of pressure and concentration, they are actually not the same value. Um, and so if you ever need to interconvert between them, this is the equation you'd use, okay? So this says that the equilibrium constant in terms of pressure equals our equilibrium constant in terms of concentration multiplied by RT with R being our ideal gas law R, okay? And it's raised to delta N. And delta N means number of moles on the of gas on the product side versus the reactant side, right? So if we look at that equation um, above the chart, 3A plus B goes to 2C, our delta N for that would be moles of um, gas on the product side, or 2, minus moles of gas on our reactant side, which would be 4. Okay, so our delta N for that equation would actually be negative 2. Okay, and that would help you interconvert between them. Um, not something they put a lot of emphasis on, but just in case, uh, maybe have that equation written down, because I don't think that is one they give you on the equation sheet. And then lastly, I just want to talk about the chart problems. So this is actually um, a screenshot of one of Dr. Katie's slides. Um, so the equation at the top is just the chemical reaction occurring, and they would give you a chart um, with information missing, right? So you know how one changes, um, but not the others, okay? And you'd have to fill in the chart to the end and then use that to solve for maybe your equilibrium constant or your reaction quotient, right? But how you would do this, you can actually do this by writing an ice table, right? So you could write, let's say, time zero would be your initial concentration. So if you wrote an ice table, our initial, um, well, in this case, it's gas. So partial pressure of A would be one. Our initial pressure of B would be 0.4. And our initial pressure of C would be zero, okay? Now, we'd write our change in terms of X here. But remember, X, or really the coefficient in front of X, relates to the stoichiometric ratios of these components. So our change in A would actually be minus 3x. And I'm saying minus because it's a reactant. We have no product, and so we know we're going to be going towards the product side. So our change for A would be minus 3x. Our change of B would just be minus x because its coefficient is 1. And our change for C, because it's a product, it would be plus, and its coefficient 2, so plus 2x, okay? And then we'd have our equilibrium amounts, okay? Now at, at equilibrium, we don't, or in this case at equilibrium, I mean at time one, right? We don't know how much B or C we have in terms of pressure. What we do know is how much our pressure of A is, right? And so by knowing the initial pressure of A and the equilibrium or minute one um, pressure of A, we can actually solve for x, right? Because in this case, the difference between 1 and 0.778 would be equal to 3x, 
So we can solve for x, and then we can solve for our equilibrium dash minute one data for both gas B and C. Okay. Um, I think just two more things they cover in chapter 13. I just want to, this is where I want to talk about the manipulations of equilibrium constants. Right? And so if you ever reverse, if you want to find the equilibrium constant for the reverse reaction, it's actually the inverse of the old one, right? So if a certain reaction has an equilibrium constant of 2, the equilibrium constant for the reverse reaction would be 1 over 2, so 1 half. Okay? If you ever have to multiply an equation by a coefficient, your new k is equal to your old one raised to that coefficient. So if we want to multiply a reaction by 2 and its um, equilibrium constant was 2 beforehand, our new equilibrium constant would be 2 raised to the second or 2 squared, which is 4. And then whenever we add reactions together that have um, different k's, we actually multiply the k's together. So I know in uh, thermo and electrochem, we actually add Q and E values, but for K's, you multiply them together. Um, and one of the questions that I do have that I'm sending out um, is actually a chart, and it asks you to fill this out. Um, and so hopefully, I think you guys um, would find that helpful and can have that next to you or near you um, during the exam. Um, or if it's, I don't even know if it's open, no, I don't know. Because um, definitely know the difference between those. That is a common mistake when we integrate all this material together, people just sometimes mix those up. And it's definitely important to know what are manipulations of K, G, and E are, because they are different from one another. Um, we can also relate temperature um, to K. I know in chapter 12, a couple slides ago, I showed you almost an identical equation that had our activation energy in it. This one relates temperature to our um, equilibrium constants, right? So that was temperature relating to rate constant. This is relating equilibrium constant to temperature. And you'll just notice that we use delta H or a change in enthalpy in this equation. Um, this is traditionally not something that they emphasize a lot, um, even during chapter 13. Um, but again, keep it in the back of your head. Be familiar with how to use it. Um, and how it different, differentiates from the one I showed you a couple slides ago. So again, this isn't looking at rate constant, it's looking at equilibrium constants um, relation to temperature, um, and it uses the change in enthalpy. Um, the R value for this would be the 8.31 value, and that's because delta H is measured in um, joules, or kilojoules, um, which is something to note. Personally, I think delta H is typically given in terms of kilojoules. And so R, you would probably want to convert from 8.31 joules per whatever the other units are to 0 0.00831 kilojoules per whatever units. Again, you need those kilojoules to cancel out. Okay, and the last part of chapter 13 is Les Chatier's principle. And so basically this is, um, I kind of think of it in terms of biological systems like homeostasis, right? So when you're at equilibrium, your reaction will actually shift to one side or another to resist changes that you make to the system. Okay, so if you ever add something, right, if you add a reactant or product, you're, you are going to shift to the other side of the equation, right? So if I add reactant, my equilibrium is going to shift towards the product side. If I remove a reactant or product, I am going to shift from that side to the side that something was removed from. So if I remove a reactant, I'm going to shift to the reactant side. If I remove a product, I will shift to the product side. A huge kind of caveat um, and something to note that they love to add in because it's very tricky is that these only refer to things that are part of equilibrium. Okay, so if I add the most classic example they use is they will often add liquid water, okay, to either the reactant or product side. And that would actually not cause a shift in equilibrium, okay? It doesn't shift equilibrium because it, water that's a liquid isn't part of our equilibrium expression, okay? So these adding, removing reactants products really only refer to gases and things in the aqueous state, okay?
Um, another common um, change they make is they might increase pressure, which means the same exact thing as decreasing volume, right? They mean um, it's the same exact change. And if you increase pressure, right, you're going to try to resist it by decreasing the pressure. And so if you increase the pressure of your system, you are going to shift to the side that has less moles of gas, right? So you're going to look at your reactant side, look how many things are in the gaseous state, right? How many things are gases, um, and on the reactant side and on the product side, and you're going to compare them. If one side has less moles of gas, you're going to shift to that side. If they have equal moles of gas, you will um, just there will be no change in equilibrium. And again, that's just because you can't shift one way or the other to resist the pressure. Okay, if you decrease pressure, which is the same thing as increasing volume, you're going to try to resist that change by increasing the pressure, which one way of doing that is having more moles of gas. Okay, so in this case, you look for the side that has more moles of gas, and that's the side you switch to. Again, if they have equal number of moles of gas on both sides, there will be no effect on equilibrium. Okay. Then we have changes in temperature. Now, changes in temperature depend on our sign of delta H, right? Our change in enthalpy. If we have a positive delta H, we have an endothermic reaction. If we have a negative delta H, we have an exothermic reaction. If they do not tell you if you have your sign of delta H or that it's endothermic or exothermic, they don't tell you that at all, you, um, the answer would probably, and it would be an option, need more information, okay? Because you cannot answer it without knowing if it's endothermic or exothermic, okay? Now, endothermic reactions will require an input of heat energy to undergo the reaction. And so heat, in a way, is like a reactant. And so I actually physically write it on the reactant side of the equation they give you. Exothermic reactions release heat as a product. And so I physically write it as a product on, um, in my chemical equation, right? So once you have it written as either a reactant or product, changing the temperature is very similar to adding or removing a reactant or product. Right? So if you increase the temperature, it's like adding um, a reactant or product. And if you decrease it, it's like removing. Okay, so if we have an exothermic reaction, right, that means heat would be on the product side. And if I said I increase the temperature from 20 degrees to 50 degrees Celsius, that means I'm increasing or kind of adding product, which means when I'm adding a product, I'm going to shift to the other side and my equilibrium will actually shift to the reactant side. Okay, so that's kind of the thinking of how to go about that problem. And catalysts, catalysts help you um, reach equilibrium um, faster, right? Okay, so it helps you reach equilibrium faster. Um, they help lower the activation energy, which is actually how you get to equilibrium faster. But it is, does not actually shift equilibrium at all. Okay, and so if they say you add a catalyst um, in a Le Chatier's principle, equilibrium would not um, change. There would be no effect, again, on equilibrium. It would speed up the reaction, but not change equilibrium. Okay, now we're getting into chapter um, 14, acid-base equilibria. Um, and as we kind of go, some of these slides get a little bit um, less and less information. Um, and again, this is mostly just because if you're confused, for example, on Thermochem, Chapter 17, um, the videos are posted. You can see my more in-depth description of all of these um, components. I mean, they're still what I think is the most important stuff, but um, pretty much anything from Chapter 14 on was around or right after spring break, and so all those videos are uploaded already. I would say this is probably the last chapter that isn't uploaded um, that you can go back and watch um, at some point uh, before the exam. Okay, so Ka and Kb are, are acid and base dissociation constants, okay? And so just something to remember about this is a dissociation constant, um, and so it's a, still products over reactants, right? There are equilibrium um, dissociation constants. And so remember to use concentrations, and again, it's products over reactants.
Um, remember our pH equals the negative log of our hydro uh, hydrogen concentration, H plus, and pOH is the negative log of our hydroxide or negative uh, OH minus concentration. Whenever you see a small p in front of something, it really just means take the negative log of. So pH is take the negative log of H or our hydrogen concentration. So in the henderson hasselbach reaction, pKa means take the negative log of your Ka. Okay, um, and then I wrote some important relationships, right? So our pH plus our pOH always has to add up to 14. Okay, we don't see it a lot, but your pH or your pOH can actually be negative, right? Your pH will be negative any time your hydrogen concentration is above one molar, okay? Which is fine, it doesn't happen a lot, but you could see it. But even when pH is negative, that relationship will hold true, that our pH plus our pOH will always equal 14, which is actually how um, our pH scale was derived um, from some of these relationships. Okay, when we multiply Ka times Kb, they will always multiply by uh, together to make 1 times 10 to the negative 14. This is, uh, hopefully you guys are very familiar with this. Um, one of their favorite things to do is give you information about an acid, right? So you'll be looking at the acid dissociation constant, Ka, but in the problem, they give you Kb, right? So in order to solve for the problem, you actually have to solve for Ka, and so to solve for Ka, Ka would be equal to 1 times 10 to the negative 14th divided by our Kb value. And then note that our hydrogen concentration times our concentration of hydroxide will also always equal 1 times 10 to the negative 14th. Again, these are some um, pretty crucial relationships that I'm sure you guys are all still very familiar with. Okay, um, remember our strong acids and bases uh, dissociate completely, right? So we just assume that if you have one molar of hydrochloric acid, HCl, that'll dissociate, oops, that'll dissociate into one molar um, H plus and one molar Cl minus. When we deal with weak acids and bases, however, these only partially dissociate, okay? And so these are, uh, have equilibria. This is what you're most used to using. Um, these are when we're gonna use our ice tables, okay? Okay, now if they don't give you a lot of information, the typical chapter 14 problem is they'll give you Ka or Kb, they'll give you an, uh, a starting amount of weak acid or weak base, and you're going to write your ice table in terms of x, right? Now, one thing that I'm sure, again, you guys are all very familiar with by now is the 5% rule, okay? And so this is telling you when you can ignore x in the denominator, right? Because typically your products which are in the numerator, will have equilibrium values of x, right, typically. Not always, but x and x is very common to see. And the equilibrium amount of your initial weak acid, let's say, would be whatever the starting concentration was, let's just say 1 molar minus x. Now we can actually just write 1 molar in the denominator, right, and ignore that x to make our calculations a lot easier, okay? But once we solve for what x is, and answer the, well, before I guess we answer the question, once we solve for x, we actually are going to do x divided by the initial amount of weak acid that we started with, okay? And we're gonna change that to a percentage. If it's under 5%, that ignoring of x was justified, your answer is correct, and you can continue on. Often you're asked for what's the pH, right? So there's only a couple more steps to solve for pH from there. If it's greater than 5%, what that means is that you can not ignore x in the denominator. And what often happen, or and what happens there is you have to go back and you actually have to use the quadratic formula to solve for x, okay? And so the quadratic formula, if you forget, is negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared um, minus 4ac, that's all under the square root, um, and that whole thing is divided by 2a where a, b, and c are coefficients, with the coefficient of x squared being a, the coefficient of um, in front of x is b, and the number on its own with no x associated with it being c. Do you remember that if um, the c value, for example, is minus 5, that you are plugging in negative 5 for c, okay? 
We also deal with uh, diprotic acids, um, which have two hydrogens. So the most common example you'll probably see is carbonic acid or H2CO3. Okay, and what you do is these are actually two set separate ice tables with two individual equilibria. Okay, they'll both have their own um, Ka's, um, and again, you just solve them independently. And the traditional question is to ask for pH and then A2 minus, which in the ter um, in terms of carbonic acid would be carbonate. What's the concentration of CO3 two minus? Now, a little hint. Um, especially if you're running out of time on the exam. This is just something that I've seen over the past four years over and over and over again. Typically, if you can spend the time going through the entire problem, I suggest that. But from what I've seen, the pH pretty much only depends on the hydrogen concentration or the concentration of H plus that you get from your first equilibria. Okay, so when you do your first ice table between carbonic acid and bicarbonate, which is HCO3 minus, when you get your X value for H plus, that should be the only number that your pH is dependent on. Okay, and the reason for this is the amount of extra H plus ions that you get from the second equilibria is typically so small compared to the first one that it doesn't actually affect your pH. So if you're running out of time and you have to solve for the pH, of a diprotic acid problem, again, you, it's probably a pretty safe bet to make um, only depend on the first ice table for that. I would again recommend doing all the workout and making sure of that, but that is something I have seen um, throughout the years. For the other component, for something like the concentration of carbonate, CO3 2 minus, which is a product of your second ice table, okay, again, if you can do it out and prove this, it's better but I have actually pretty much always found that value to be equal to your Ka2, which is your second um, acid dissociation constant, right? So if Ka1 is one times 10 to the negative seventh, Ka2 is two times 10 to the negative 12th, let's say, typically I have always found that the concentration of carbonate, CO3 two minus, to be equal to Ka2, which would be 2 times 10 to the negative 12. I think that's the number I said. <laughs> um, and the reason for this is that the other components, so the portion that's in the denominator and the other portion in the numerator, end up canceling each other out in, again, I think every problem I've seen in my four years um, surrounded by this uh, chemistry department. Okay. The last term is percent ionization. So remember, ionization in terms of like acids, for example, right? It'll ionize when it when it dissociates. So really, this is saying how much it dissociates. So one thing to know is the stronger the acid is, the greater its percent ionization will be, because really, percent ionization is saying how much of it turns into products. And how do you solve for this? Well, it's a percent, so we multiply it by hundred but it's our equilibrium concentration of H+, plus, so our equilibrium concentration of protons, divided by our initial concentration of acid, okay, of initial acid. Okay, so 50% ionization would mean that half, or 50% of our initial acid became products, and half remained as the initial weak acid. Okay. <sighs> Chapter 15, so buffers and titrations. Um, so we went over these for a very long time. There's kind of a more, there's not a lot to say about them. I think it's just um, doing a lot more practice, but just some reminders for you. So buffers consist of both an acid and its conjugate base, or a base and its conjugate acid. Okay, you need both in the solution from the beginning for it to be a buffer. Okay, so that's the first thing. Um, kind of going off these slides for a second, remember the buffering capacity of a buffering system is it's plus or minus one unit above or below its pKa. Okay, so if you find the pKa for a buffering system is 7, it can buffer between the pHs of 6 and 8. Okay, so one pH unit above and below its pKa. Um, things that make it um, a more effective buffer um, so the closer the pKa is to the pH, 
the better the buffer will be. Um, the buffer is best when there's equal amounts of um, base and conjugate acid, right? So if the concentration of B minus and HB are the same, that would be where the buffer is best. Um, and the more buffering components you have, the better the buffer, right? So if I have one molar B minus, one molar HB, that is a worse buffer than if I had five molar B minus and five molar HB. Okay, now kind of coming back to the slides. So um, for these types of problems, you can actually use concentration, so molarity, or moles in your ice table and in the henderson hasselbach I know it shows concentration, but you can actually also use moles, uh, which is what I typically tend to do. And the reason for this is that the volumes are actually the same for all of our components, and so they actually would just cancel each other out. Um, so again, either one is fine, but um, they'll both get you the same answer at the end of the day. Okay? Um, remember when you're writing your ice table that your change is represented by the amount of acid or base added. Okay, so let's say we start with a weak acid, right? And so that means on the product side, we would see H plus plus our conjugate base, right? So acid plus our conjugate base would be on the product side. If we add hydroxide, right, base, OH minus, we are going to add to the product side. The reason for this is buffers like to neutralize. The whole point of them is they neutralize the acid or base being added. Okay, so if we're adding hydroxide or base, we're going to neutralize it by shifting, shifting our buffer system um, to create more acid or H plus to counteract and neutralize that hydroxide added. Okay, so if I add one mole of hydroxide, I would theoretically, I mean, it depends on the numbers, I guess, but the chain should be plus one mole to the product side and minus one mole from the reactant side. Again, that's because you want the change in terms of H plus to be one mole, right? Because that one mole of H plus will counteract the one mole of hydroxide added to make one mole of water. That is our neutralization reaction, okay? Um, if we have acid as a product in our equation, right? So H plus is a product and we add acid, right? Um, we would actually subtract from the product side, right? So if you have H plus in your equation and you're adding H plus, you would subtract it as your change. Um, and I think I had a session on, uh, I'm trying to remember the date, um, April maybe 6th or 7th, where I go through um, buffers and titration questions and kind of explain this a little more clearly. Um, I think it was like the 6th, 7th, and 8th uh, around there that week. Um, if you are confused about the change portion still, I would definitely recommend looking over those. Okay, and basically the change um, really only matters because you want to see how the concentration of your acid in your conjugate base changes. Because once you apply that change, you can find your equilibrium concentration of um, base and con or acid and conjugate base, and you just plug it into the henderson hasselbach equation along with the pKa, and you could find the pH very easily from there, okay? Okay, so now just going on to titrations, which we'll kind of go through a little bit quickly. Again, um, this specifically, I made a whole extra session just to go through one problem um, very slowly, part by part, with you guys. If you do want to check it out, I believe that one was on um, April 6th or 7th. Um, I think it was a Tuesday. I definitely know that it was a Tuesday. So um, if you want to check out that session. Um, but for titrations, I can't emphasize enough. When you use your ice table, always use moles. You cannot use concentration for this. Um, and it's because your two components, your weak acid and your strong base, for example, will have different volumes. And so you just can't compare them without converting them to moles. Okay, and we look at two different types of titrations. We see strong acid with strong base titrations, so strong, strong titrations, or we see weak with strong titrations. So you might start with a weak acid or a weak base, which is being titrated by a strong acid or strong base. Okay, very simplistically, kind of, I mean, it makes it sound very easy. It's not this straightforward, but um, if you're ever doing a strong acid, strong base titration, 
what you really do is convert to moles and you solve for excess moles of H plus or hydroxide, right? So if I have 0.2 moles of H plus and 0.5 moles of hydroxide, I have 0.3 moles of excess hydroxide, okay? That's really what I care about. I would take that 0.3 moles of excess hydroxide and convert to concentration, okay? So I divide it by total volume. Again, remember it's total volume. Um, to find the concentration of hydroxide. And from there, I could find my pOH, which I can then use to find my pH. So it's um, pretty straightforward, strong acid, strong base. If you solve for the excess H plus or hydroxide, convert moles of excess H plus or hydroxide to concentration, and then solve for pH directly or find pOH, and then find pH by just knowing that pH plus pOH equals 14 always. Oh. Now, the more common example is when we start with a weak species and we titrate it with a strong one. And these always fall into one of three categories that have a pretty uh, reliable set of steps to um, solve for them. So the first one is before equivalence point, the second one's at equivalence point, and the last one is after the equivalence point. Okay, so these are in relation to moles of weak um, species you start with. So I'm going to pretend we start with a weak base and we're titrating with a strong acid. Um, yeah, weak base with a strong acid. Okay, so at my equivalence point, my moles of weak base will be equal to the moles of strong acid that I add. Okay, so the moles will be equal there. When my moles of weak species that I start with is greater than my moles of strong acid that I'm adding, that is describing before the equivalence point, okay? But if I had too many moles of my strong acid, and so that the number of moles of strong acid is greater than my number of moles of weak base, I have actually passed the equivalence point, or after, I'm after the equivalence point. So that'd be situation three. Now again, um, the session I pointed out a couple minutes ago, I definitely um, recommend if this kind of confuses you. Um, but these are the general steps. So you can follow these steps to get the answer. Again, I think at least 95% of the time. And these steps will um, be applicable anytime you're before the equivalence point. Okay, so as long as you can um, figure out which situation you are in, these steps should be able to help you find your answer. Now you'll notice, and I have two more slides for the other two scenarios, but I have parentheses with a dash and like two different things in it, okay? Before the dash um, is when you have a uh, weak acid and you're titrating with a strong base, okay? So if you have weak acid, strong base titration, whatever's on the left of the dash is what... Um, it should be for that scenario. After the dash, so in this slide I have H plus after the dash, that applies to when you start with a weak base and you're titrating with a strong acid. Okay, so you'd write your ice table, you put your change in terms of the amount of base or acid added, find our equilibrium amounts, and plug into the Henderson-Hasselbach. Okay, before equivalence point you can always use Henderson-Hasselbach. Okay, again, this one's a little more complicated, but when you look at these parentheses, again, on the left side of the dash will always be applicable for when you start with a weak acid and titrate with a strong base. After the dash will always be when you start with a weak base and titrate with a strong acid. Okay, um, again, I'll leave this up for a second, um, but it's most helpful to kind of look at these steps while going through a titration problem. I think that's when it makes it most um, clear, okay? So these are the steps um, for at equivalence point. This is definitely the hardest and most intensive step um, because remember, you actually have to do a reverse ice table um, and then solve for equilibrium in terms of X, relate that to Ka or Kb, it's, um, and then solve for X. It's a, it's a pretty lengthy process um, at the equivalence point, okay? And then this is past the equivalence point. So again, the parentheses rules um, are the same as the last two slides, um, but this process will actually seem very similar 
or mostly similar to the strong acid, strong base titrations. Um, one thing I'd point out is definitely take time to know your strong acids and strong bases. The last thing you want to do is start doing one of these long processes and realize that you had a strong acid, strong base titration the whole time. Because strong acid, strong base titrations, you can probably solve for in about a minute or two, something at equivalence point where it's weak acid with a strong base might take you four minutes to do, maybe five, maybe longer, uh, maybe less too. But um, again, it's just much more um, labor intensive when you have a weak acid or base involved. So definitely make sure that you do have a weak acid or base involved when you use those processes. Okay. Chapter 16, we look at other equilibria. So we see formation constant, Kf. This is when we have ions on the reactant side. And on the product side, it'll be a complex ion, right? So just a really complicated looking ion or a solid on the product side. It can be either one. Our solubility product constant, which you've probably just been calling Ksp, that's what I refer to it as. Um, this is the dissociation of solid. So a solid will be a reactant, and our product will be the ions that it splits into. Because so remember, everything is slightly soluble um, to an extent. Um, remember, these are still equilibria um, constants, and so we do not include solids or liquids in our um, Ksp or Kf equations, right? We're only looking at the actual ions. Um, and because we're dealing with solids, we don't really see anything in terms of the gas state um, for chapter 16 either. It's typically just aqueous or solid, um, some liquids. But again, we only pay attention to things in the aqueous um, solution. Sorry, state. Um, common ion effect. So having a common ion in a solution decreases the solubility of a solid um, including that ion, right? So if an ion is in a solid, right? So let's say, um, I'm trying to think of one quickly, NaF, sodium fluoride. Sodium fluoride will be less soluble in a 0.1 molar solution of potassium fluoride than it would be in water. Why? That's because potassium fluoride or 0.1 molar potassium fluoride already has 0.1 molar of fluoride in it. Yeah, um, yeah, fluoride in it. And so because our solid is NaF, sodium fluoride, they have a common ion of that fluoride, fluorine, and so the solubility will be less than in water. Now, again, this is one that we have done since um, kind of being remote. Um, and so I do have a problem or two. I'm not sure quite the session um, it was, but where I actually mathematically prove this um, and we talk about the theory of it. I also believe um, it was part of the, the practice exam for chapter um, 15 and 16. I think it was. Okay, so common ion effect, um, be able to apply the theory of it to a theoretical question, but also be able to solve for it. Um, so just realize if you have a solution with a common ion, that solution, in my example, it was fluorine, would actually have an initial concentration um, that's not zero, right? I said 0.1 molar, and so my initial concentration of fluorine would be 0.1. Okay, so forming a precipitate, okay? Um, so remember, KSP, our reactant side, is a solid, and our product side are ions. Okay, so if we solve for Q, which again, Q we just solve for when we're not sure if we're at equilibrium or not, right? If we solve for Q and we compare it to our KSP and Q is greater, that means we have too many products in relation to equilibrium, which means we're going to shift left to the reactant side. Well, if we shift to the reactant side, that actually means we're shifting towards the formation of a solid. And so we will actually form solid anytime Q is greater than Ksp. When Q is less than Ksp, that means we don't have enough products, which means we're going to favor moving to the product side, which will be formation of ions from solids. So we will not form a solid precipitate um, when Q is less than Ksp, okay? When we're at our KSP, that actually refers, and kind of using terminology back from chapter 11 that we just went over not too long ago, when we're at KSP, that is when we have a saturated solution. Okay. 
selective precipitation. Um, I talked about there were there was a good problem of it um, in the practice multiple choice for um, you know chapter sixteen. If you haven't actually, if you just looked at the work and didn't listen to um, what I talked about during it, I would definitely suggest going back. I talked about um, other questions they could try to have you solve for. So the typical question is which one precipitates first. And so basically you'll have two solids um, or two potential solids that will precipitate out of a solution and they'll share a common ion, right? And so what you're going to do is you're going to basically set these numbers equal to their KSP, right? So you'll say KSP equals whatever ions make up that solid, and you're going to solve for the concentration of that common ion needed to reach that KSP, right? So if it's like, uh, I think the example I used was copper iodide and maybe mercury iodide. And so you actually have the initial concentration of copper and mercury, and you just need to solve for what concentration of iodide gets each of these to KSP? Because realize any amount over that value that you solve for, that you add, your Q will be greater than your KSP, which will cause precipitate to form. Okay, so a common question will be, um, which one forms first? Um, what concentration is needed for this solid to start precipitating? Um, but in that... Um, the review video, I think I threw out another question where they'd actually talk about the solid that precipitates second, okay? And they would actually say when this solid that precipitates second starts precipitating, how much, so let's say mercury iodide precipitated second, how much copper is left in the solution when um, mercury iodide starts precipitating? And so a problem like that, you'd actually solve for what um, concentration of iodide is needed for mercury iodide to start precipitating. And then you'd plug that I value in, that iodide um, concentration in, to the KSP equation for copper iodide. And you'd solve for the concentration of copper needed to be at KSP. But realize that is the copper still in the solution. Okay, so how much copper is, that's, if they're asked how much copper is left in the solution, that's your answer. If they ask how much copper is out of solution or how much copper is in the precipitate, it would be the difference between what you just solved for and the initial amount of copper. Okay, um, and that one, I, I think I'll add, um, if it's not already, I, most of the questions are written for the practice I'm going to release, um, but I'm releasing it later just because I want to make sure everything comes out right. I want to make sure I can mathematically um, do them all first um, and that there should be no errors. Um, but that one I will uh, make sure is on there um, as a practice problem for you guys. Okay, um, these last couple of chapters I'm going to go through a little quicker. Again, just because we much more recent. I'm sure they're a lot more familiar. And again, you can reference the videos um, that I've been posting. So chapter 17 relates to thermochemistry. So we look at the um, Gibbs free energy equation a lot. So delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. Delta H is our change in enthalpy, so that's a measure of bond energy. Delta S is our change in entropy, which is a measure of disorder. Okay, remember that um, entropy or disorder increases with temperature. Okay, so it increases with temperature because as temperature increases, you have more um, microstates and you have more um, vibration and rotation in your um particle, whatever your particle is, whether it's a solid, liquid, or gas, as temperature increases, it'll have slightly more mobility, which is kind of seen as disorder. Um, definitely note that gases have the greatest entropy and solids have the least bit. Okay, so um, again, it was in my practice, but um, be able to look at basic trends. So look at a reactant side, product side, and um, be able to kind of be able to predict which side has lower or higher entropy based on that. Okay, um, remember, just kind of going back up to the top, when delta G is negative, so when delta G is less than zero, it's a spontaneous reaction, okay, so that's favorable. And when at equilibrium, um, delta G will equal zero, okay? Okay, here's just kind of like a picture of three important uh, equations. So remember that delta G, not the reaction, or just delta G of the reaction, 
will be equal to the sum of the delta G of all the products minus the sum of the delta G of all the reactants, right? We've, um, and that equation is very similar or the same if you're solving for delta S, right? The delta S would be equal to the sum of the delta S of our products minus the sum of the delta S of our reactants. Um, that's how you solve for those if they give you individual S values or G values. Remember that those are typically given in either kilojoules or joules per mole. And so remember to multiply their coefficients by their values, right? So remember stoichiometry ratios. Okay, the second equation is actually derived from the third equation, right? So that third equation relates delta G to delta G naught. So delta G naught we just calculate at equilibrium um, and has some assumptions associated with it. Okay, um, so delta G, that's the third equation on this slide, um, you solve for when we're not at equilibrium. So that's saying that our actual change of Gibbs free energy is equal to our standard change of Gibbs free energy plus R, which would be our 8.31 value, right? Because we're dealing with energy, which is in terms of joules and kilojoules, multiplied by our temperature times the natural log of our reaction quotient. Now, we said on the last slide that at equilibrium, delta G is equal to zero. And so if we make that assumption, that's how we come up with that second equation on this slide. Delta G naught equals negative RT ln K. And it makes sense that we use this at equilibrium because in the equation, we actually use K, our equilibrium constant, which we only use when we're at equilibrium. Okay, coming back to manipulation. So manipulations of G, if they ever ask you for the delta G value when of the reverse reaction, you just change the sign on G, right? So you multiply it by negative one, you change the sign. If you multiply by a co an equation by a coefficient, you multiply your delta G value by the same coefficient, okay, your same value. And when you add reactions together, you just simply add your delta G values together. Okay, moving on to electrochemistry. So kind of the components of a cell, right? So a cell needs to be a full circuit. We have a wire and a salt bridge. Now the wire um, is how electrons flow, okay? And so they always flow from anode to cathode. That will never change, okay? So our electrons will always go from anode to cathode, okay? Which kind of makes sense. Anodes where oxidation occurs, so electrons are being lost. Cathode where reduction occurs, electrons are being gained. So electrons are quite literally going from where they're lost to where they're gained. Now, electrons carry a negative charge. So as electrons flow in a one, a unidirection, right? It's only unidirectional. Um, this creates a charge imbalance. Now, this charge imbalance is balanced out by the salt bridge, which allows ions to cross. Um, and again, just kind of balance this charge out. Okay, so that's why the salt bridge is there. Now we kind of already talked about this, but we have two electrodes. We have our anode, which is where oxidation occurs. So remember, oxidation is where we see an increase in oxidation number. Okay, I remember this because anode and oxidation both start with a vowel. Okay, cathode is where reduction occurs. Um, it's where something is reduced. Again, these are both consonants, C and R consonants. That's how I remember cathode reduced or reduction. Um, and again, if something's reduced, it, decrease, it has a decrease in oxidation number. Now the proper notation, um, now this is written pretty simply, is anode on the left of a semicolon, cathode on the right, okay? Now, part of the anode, you'll have a reactant on the left, left side, <laughs> and its product um, next to it, kind of on the right side, but still all of that will occur on the left of the semicolon. Your cathode reaction, um, will occur on the right of the semicolon. Okay, so anode on the left, cathode on the right. You can kind of see it as from left to right, it's how electrons flow. Okay. And I think one of my questions has you practicing um, that as well, standard notation. Just some very um, essential terminology. So voltaic and galvanic cells actually mean the same thing. They have a positive E, um, like cell potential, and these are spontaneous cells, okay? So these like to occur. They're like batteries, okay? Electrolytic cells have a negative E value. They're non-spontaneous cells. And it's like when a rechargeable battery is being recharged, right? It's using an external force to go against 
the cell potential, right? Because a battery wouldn't just sit there and recharge itself. It needs an external force to help it go against its natural reduction potential, which a battery uses its natural reduction potential to help power things like a remote control, okay? Um, when you're solving one, um, somebody did ask me recently in a session, um, they said that they learned it was like cathode minus anode or maybe the reverse. I don't want to confuse you because I don't remember it in that way. Um, doing it that way and doing it my way is identical. Um, I just physically flip one of the reactions um, and you just order them in a way. And so how I always solve these cells is I flip one of my reactions to oxidation Right, so the reaction that occurs at the anode will be oxidized. So that's um, they're always given in terms of reduction potentials. And so I flip the equation, which means I change the sign on E, and then one one will be in terms of oxidation, one will be in terms of reduction, and I just simply add the E's together to find my cell potential. Now you might ask, how do I know which one I have to flip? Which one's going to be oxidized if they're both given in terms of reduction? And they have to give you some hint. Okay, so typically they'll use terminology, right? They'll say it's a voltaic or galvanic cell. They could tell you it's spontaneous. They could tell you it's an electrolytic cell. They could tell you it's non-spontaneous, that it has a negative E. These terms are all um, great buzzwords to tell you what type, which one should be flipped. Um, another potential thing, um, and I think when I first did electrochem in the first session that I started it, I actually gave... Um, the proper notation of a cell, and you'd have to know that on the left side of the semicolon was my anode, which is where oxidation occurs, and so that reaction that I wrote there was the one that had to be flipped, and then I could add my E values to find my cell potential. Okay, now here are two equations. The bottom one is what we know as the Nernst equation, um, but I'll first focus on the top equation. So the top equation is that our standard cell potential is equal to R times T over NF ln K. Now F is Faraday's constant. It is a constant. Um, and it's in terms of, I'm not sure the entire units, but I know it's in terms of joules, which helps me know that that R value needs to be my 8.31 value so that it has joules to cancel out the joules that is there from Faraday's constant. Okay. What you'll notice is that um, at the end, it says ln k, so we use this equation when we're at equilibrium, okay? We also use this equation when we're at 25 degrees Celsius or 298 Kelvin, okay? Whenever you're at equilibrium 298 Kelvin, this is the equation to use the top one, okay? N represents in your balanced chemical equation, um, well, I guess your balanced chemical equations, your electrons have to cancel out. But when your electrons cancel out, right, when you're adding your half reactions together, they should have the same number of electrons. One of them will have electrons as a reactant, the other one as a product. Every time it should be that way. The coefficient of the electrons when you cancel them out, right, so I think in my practice exam, I had one that it was six electrons. That is the value of N, okay? So if in your balance, kind of like your balanced reaction, right before the electrons are canceled out, Whatever the coefficient of electrons is, that is your n value. Okay, the bottom equation is your Nernst equation, which um, compares cell potential to standard cell potential. Some things to note here, it looks very similar, but you'll notice we use Q here. So we use this when we are not at equilibrium. It also shows, because it's Q and Q can change, how the change in concentrations of reactants or products can change our cell potential. In addition, you must use the Nernst equation, you must use this equation when our temperature is not 25 degrees Celsius. So even if they say we're at equilibrium, um, but they say our temperature is 30 degrees Celsius, you'd actually have to solve for E naught when the temperature is at 25 degrees Celsius and when at equilibrium. Then you can plug that E naught or standard cell potential into the Nernst equation Q in this case, if we're at equilibrium, would be equal to K. So you just plug in the equilibrium constant for Q. But our temperature would not be 25 degrees Celsius or 298 Kelvin. It would actually be 303 Kelvin, which is 30 degrees Celsius. Okay? So anytime you're not at equilibrium or, or I should say and dash, or you're not at 25 degrees Celsius, you should use that bottom equation, the Nernst equation. Okay.
think this is the last part of electrochem. It's just manipulations of E. You'll notice these are very similar to delta G. If you reverse a reaction, which is what we do when we flip a reaction from reduction to oxidation, you just multiply E by negative 1. So you change the sign on it. Okay, skipping down to the last one, we add reactions together. We just e add the cell potentials together, right? That's how we do to solve what the cell potential of an overall cell is. But the big thing to note is that when you multiply by a coefficient, so if you multiply your entire equation by a coefficient, your cell potential in terms of oxidation and reduction does not change, okay? Um, this is vastly different from delta G, and so that's why I really like to emphasize it. If you multiply an electrochemical reaction by a coefficient, there is no change to our cell potential. Oh, uh, um, I did throw in this one, um, this slide. It's kind of comparing all these units in electrochem. Um, I'm going to be honest. I don't really see them putting in more than one, um, maybe two problems on this, if that. Um, it's something they don't emphasize too much. If they were, I know Dr. Katie has a pretty good example of one or two of these. If they were to ask you about one of these, I think they would ask you about Coulombs or maybe Amperes, right? So using a balanced chemical equation or a half reaction, right, you could solve for moles of electrons being transferred and then use that um, value that's given on this slide, one mole of electrons equals 9.648 times 10 to the fourth Coulombs. Use that to find how many Coulombs and then if you are given a time period, if you divide it by time, that would give you amperes. Um, again, I just put it in here to remind you that this is in the chapter. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can kind of base on what they asked on your last exam on this stuff. It's just not typically um, the highest priority from them. Okay, and this is kind of connecting. It's really more than chapter 13. It's kind of connecting chapter 13, 14, 16. 17 and 18, but really it's combining these three big terms we spent the majority of the semester studying, right? So given delta G, K, or equilibrium constant, or our cell potential, we can interconvert between any of these using these equations, okay? So definitely be familiar with these. Um, looking at them, think all the variables you should know, right? Um, so R in all these equations should be your 8.31 R. Temperature should always be in Kelvin. N is, um, again, how many moles of electrons are transferred. F is Faraday's constant. E naught cell is our standard cell potential. Um, these should all be familiar to you. Okay, and lastly, just a couple slides. I think it's three slides on nuclear chem, just some terminology. Um, so remember, and I like to kind of differentiate between these because they're very similar um, in structure. They look pretty similar. Fusion and fission. So fusion, a lot of people kind of know as combining things, um, which does happen, I guess, in nuclear chem. We don't focus on it as much. We kind of focus a little bit more on the fission component, which is dividing or splitting of something. Um, so the way I think of this, um, again, I'm a biology major, so I think of like binary fission and prokaryotes. That is their way to replicate. They go from one cell um, to asexually reproduce into two, right? So fission um, is splitting, dividing, okay? Um, Half-life, again, we kind of talked about in chapter 12. It's how long it takes for half of something to decay or disappear, and critical mass, um, there's also subcritical mass, but critical mass is there's enough neutrons and material to create a fission chain reaction, which is kind of how uh, like a hydrogen bomb, um, bomb like how a atom bomb works in general, right? If you have, When you have the critical mass, there's enough to not just create one fission reaction, but several that induce more and more and more. I believe I did nuclear all in one session, um, I think Monday. So if you want more details on this, I definitely ch um, suggest checking it out. Um, but these are kind of the main ones that we have. Sorry, I just want to see what was next. Um, so we have alpha particles, which are associated with alpha decay, beta particles with beta decay, gamma rays from gamma decay, um, neutrons, positron emission, electron capture, and protons. Um, so if you lose a neutron or proton, you guys obviously know what that means, okay? So I'm kind of just going to focus on the other five for right now. So alpha particle, 
Um, something to note about it, it is the most ionizing particle. Um, so what that means is that when an alpha particle is lost, it helps create things into ions, right? So ions have charges. What that means in biological systems, so like your body, the creation of ions isn't necessary. It's not really good because ions are extremely reactive because of their charge. And when they react with certain things like uh, membranes um, and stuff, it can be very hazardous and harmful to us. If they react with your DNA, they can create mutations, which is how um, disease states like cancer end up occurring. The thing about alpha particles is that they're actually very easy to block, right? They're not um, very good at penetrating um, different things. So they can, they can easily be blocked by clothes and by our skin, okay? So really, if you're wearing a clothes, you're pretty safe to alpha particles. Um, now, an alpha particle, when it's lost from a nucleus, right, nuclear chemistry, we're looking at the nucleus of atoms. Um, when we lose an alpha particle, that means we lose two neutrons and two protons, okay? And you'll definitely be looking at your classic atomic symbols while doing um, nuclear chemistry again. I suggest, um, I think the session on Monday went pretty well, um, but we would... Um, if we're losing two neutrons and two protons, because we're losing protons, our element is actually going to change, right? We're not going to have the same element as before. And our um, atomic mass is actually going to decrease by a unit of four AMU, or atomic mass units. Again, two from the neutrons being lost and two from the protons being lost. Now, beta particles, um, one more thing about alpha particles, they are... I'm not sure if I said this, the most ionizing, in case they want you to order it for some reason. Beta particles are um, ionizing, but not as much as alpha particles. But one thing about them is they are much more penetrating than alpha particles, okay? So you would actually need like a sheet of metal to block them from penetrating something, okay? And what happens during um, beta decay is you actually lose an electron from the nucleus, now, I know you're probably thinking, okay, but don't electrons exist in orbitals around the nucleus? There aren't any electrons actually in the nucleus. And that is actually completely true. What happens during beta decay is a neutron actually gets transformed into a proton and an electron. And again, because neutrons are in the nucleus, this electron is in the nucleus and is lost. That is our beta particle, kind of like the loss of that electron. So what happens here is we go from a neutron to a proton. So we go from basically one atomic mass unit to one atomic mass unit. This is assuming that, again, electrons don't really have a mass. Okay, so we don't actually change in the mass of this um, nucleus doesn't change. Okay, so our atomic mass won't change. But we're gaining a proton that we didn't have before. And so we actually change our element. And the thing about beta decay is that we actually go one proton up the periodic table, um, which is the only type of decay that that actually um, occurs. Okay, going to gamma rays. Okay, so gamma rays are actually the least ionizing, but they're very dangerous because the only way to block them is with like feet of cement, which is a lot. It's really hard to block them. Something to note is that these aren't actually particles, which is why they're called rays. They're actually just packets of energy. Okay, so there's no particle being lost, right? There's no electrons being lost. There's no neutrons, no protons being lost. So both your atomic mass and your number of protons, aka your element, will not change. All that's happening is it's going from a higher energy state to a lower energy state. Okay. The only comment I want to make about a neutron is um, its ability to penetrate. So again, we said alpha particles can only, like, they get blocked by skin and clothes. Beta particles need, uh, can get blocked by metal. Okay. Neutrons can penetrate both skin, clothes, and metal, but will get stopped by things like water. Okay. So it's more penetrating than alpha and beta particles, but gamma rays can go through all of those and need feet of cement to be stopped. So if they asked you, what is the order from greatest to least penetration of these particles, gamma would be greatest, followed by neutron, then beta, then alpha. Okay.
And they're just kind of explaining what positron emission and electron capture is. So in positron emission, we look at the nucleus and a proton actually converts itself to a neutron and I'm kind of using air quotes here, an electron. But the thing about an, the electron, we call it or say it's kind of like an electron because its mass is identical to that of an electron, but it actually has a positive charge. Okay, so you lose a positively charged species with the mass of an electron from the nucleus there's a, uh, during positron emission. Okay, you'll notice a proton is um, changed to a neutron. Okay, so the mass shouldn't change, 1 AMU to 1 AMU. So the mass won't change, but you are losing a proton. Okay, so the atomic, you will lose one proton and your actual chemical species will change. Um, okay, so your atomic symbol would be different. And again, you lose a positively charged species with the mass of an, an electron um, from the nucleus during that. Okay, electron capture actually requires an input of an electron. Right, so an electron comes in, it reacts with a proton in the nucleus, and this proton is converted to a neutron, and um, the difference about this, besides an electron needing to come in, is this also produces X-rays, okay? And so, just like positron emission, our mass shouldn't change of our nucleus, um, but we will have a decrease in one proton, and so our element will change. Again, the difference between positron emission and electron capture is positron emission emits a positively charged species with the mass of an electron. Electron capture requires an input of an electron, and you get an output of x-rays. Okay. And this is a, a summary slide that I really, really like. It just kind of shows you, um, you know, what happens to A and Z, you know, the nuclear equation. So A is your atomic mass. So you'd see an alpha decay. Your A would decrease by four, right? Because you're losing two protons and two neutrons. But our Z, which is our atomic number, um, the number of protons we have, is um, minus two because we're losing two protons okay and that's also shown in the last column and i really like it um, the representation also shows you what is being lost so alpha particle we have two green and two um clear kind of uh circles being lost uh the green i believe represents um protons and the clear would represent uh neutrons okay so i think it's a pretty good summary slide um, and just kind of before wrapping up, I should really talk about the purpose of decay. So what happens is most um, elements towards the end of the periodic table are extremely unstable, right? And so the whole purpose of decay is um, they're trying to become more and more stable um, by undergoing these different types of decay. Okay, so that's really the purpose. They're trying to find a more stable state. And so um, I went through two different types of examples on Monday. One was one where I just showed um, kind of elements and their masses and told, asked what type of decay is occurring in each step. I would definitely suggest kind of being able to identify those. Um, so I think that's really good practice if you want to look at those. Um, I think mine, they would just ask for one or two steps on your exam. I don't think they would make it as long as mine. And then the other one was a mathematical um, problem that I would 100% look over. Dr. Katie went over one. Um, it's looking at um, uh, nuclear fission, um, and it's actually mass defect. So when you look at your product and reactant side, there's actually a difference in the mass, which we know conservation of mass, so we shouldn't see a change in mass. But what happens is we find that mass defect, the change in mass from rea uh, product side to rea or reactant side to product side, and we can plug that into the equation, E equals mc squared. I'm sure you're very familiar with that. Um, Einstein's work, and that actually um, shows you the amount of energy that is um, associated with the mass lost. And what happens is you're not really, I mean, you are losing mass, but you lose it in terms of the energy released um, during that fission process. And so that's why we see a mass defect. Um, because Dr. Katie went over it, um, and it's really the only mathematical type problems to go um, over in chapter 19. I would definitely be familiar um, with that.
Okay. Um, yeah. Wow. This is my last session of six semesters of doing this. Um, so thank you guys. You guys were a great class to work with. Um, I wish you guys the best of luck. Um, get plenty of sleep the night before. I know 8 a.m. is a less than ideal time um, for <laughs> a chemistry exam. Um, I know my brain was barely functioning when I got in to take it. Um, but I will be posting open-ended um, questions with solutions. Um, I'm saying tomorrow, if I can get them up tonight, I will. Um, again, most of them are written out, um, and I believe they work out. I just need to physically solve them myself to make sure that I don't have to make any changes before I release them to you guys. Um, but they should be posted by, I would say, probably 3 p.m. tomorrow or so. Um, I will post them in the same section as this video will be posted. Um, again, if you could please send out, I'm send out, if you could please fill out that evaluation form, I would greatly appreciate it. Again, it should only take two to three minutes. Um, it's really just getting feedback for um, SI as a whole, um, so that hopefully we can expand into new classes to help you guys um, in the future as well, and to help future classes coming to UConn. Um, again, thank you guys. You guys have been uh, really great. Uh, been a great uh, class to work with, and I uh, I wish you guys the best of luck.